last of you can find a couple of seats randomly out there, but welcome. Uh, my name's Neil Denari. I'm the director of the school. Um, tonight we have uh, Michael Speaks uh, as part of our continuing series on globalization. Um, before I introduce him, I'll just remind you that um, the two final speakers are Rafael Maneo on December the 2nd and Christian de Portsenpark, who's the final speaker of the um, French production of Public Space series uh, on December the 9th, and they'll complete the series. Um, many of you have, have, have heard me, uh, those of you who are students at SIARC, have heard me at one point or another introduce Michael um, speaks to the school, and I've sort of gone over uh, quite a bit his, his sort of more academic background, and as I'm um, a believer in relatively short introductions, I'll, I'll maintain that by um, asking what does Michael Speaks do. Um, it's generally sort of been held in the kind of critical marketplace uh, in, in academic production and so forth that um, philosophy per se as a tradition kind of ended in the 20th century with people like Sartre and, and, and Wittgenstein and that at least since the war and, and uh, probably even more specifically in the last 25 years um, philosophy has been replaced or supplanted or eclipsed or um, reborn in the name of theory and that all kind of writing and cultural production now comes under the the kind of uh, title of theory. Uh, we all use that term uh, very, very loosely. Um, at times, theory is used um, uh, by the uh, detractors of it as being that which we can't understand, uh, that which is impractical, uh, that which is decorative, uh, that which is uh, unwanted. Um, from a kind of practice or discipline of architecture, which in its material condition um, has all sorts of poetic uh, values to it, which uh, theory can't um, particularly describe. But uh, um, Michael himself uh, has probably gone on record uh, more than once by saying, in fact, um, he's not even a theoretician. Um, and so if the move is from philosophy to theory, what is it that uh, in a way he's doing, because he's not necessarily arguing that theory isn't going on out there. Um, we could point to uh, Michael Hayes's book, which um, Michael uh, Speaks was a respondent to at a conference in, in Columbia that was recently published uh, on theory, architecture theory since 1968, which is a sort of a um, sequel to a book that Joan Ackman did on uh, theory from 1945 to 1968. So what does Michael do if he kind of doesn't quote unquote do theory? Um, there's probably theoretical aspects to what he does and in fact on the SciArc lecture poster if you looked at it closely it says writer and consultant in addition to um, uh, being of course the head of the, uh, the graduate program at SciArc. One has to uh, understand Michael's work as research uh, one has to understand it as speculation of another kind, but it's certainly centered around the idea of practice. And traditionally, uh, we would understand practice um, as potentially uh, on the other side of theory, and theory and practice uh, sometimes being unhinged, and maybe for some people always should be, and in other practices they're bonded in a particular way. His uh, investigations into Peter Eisenman, who uh, may be erring on the side of theory as opposed to practice, um, uh, all the way to Kohlhaus, who now be, may be erring more on building uh, than, than theory and so forth in this sort of um, rheostat uh, or, or recipe of, of uh, uh, what is building uh, and practice and, and theory. I think Michael is offering a kind of new type of practice, not only his own, but as he pries open the possibilities of um, kind of making those binaries disappear a little bit, 
Uh, he's written about the idea of the production of writing from uh, his articles in, in any magazine in the uh, beginnings of that uh, uh, journal to, uh, I think, what he'll talk about tonight, which is fundamentally work being done. Uh, the Why are we interested in the Dutch and his uh, um, exhibition that he curated, which is now on the East Coast, called Big Soft Orange. Um, so what does Michael Speaks do, uh, I think, is, is not uh, a small question. And let's welcome Michael Speaks. Well, 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 the first thing Michael Speaks will do is to get some water, I think. Um, one of the things I, I really want to talk about tonight uh, is research. Um, I want to thank Neil for his terrific introduction, um, but I also uh, want to say something about research. Um, I, I saw for the first time this, uh, this poster uh, that uh, bear some weird resemblance to to my own visage um, outside the uh, uh, outside today. I don't know if you saw it. It has a it's a Rolling Stone. Uh, it's a cover of Rolling Stone with uh, with a really horrific image uh, of me on it. Um, and I would encourage anyone uh, who's doing research uh, uh, into the background of potential speakers that you do a little better job finding photograph uh, next time, or at least, uh, at least find one that's more flattering, uh, <laughs> unless the intent was to embarrass me, in which case uh, you've succeeded. Um, that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, almost everything I say will come in threes, but I assure you this is not uh, a sermon uh, uh, or even a lecture. It just so happens that there are threes with everything tonight. Uh, so there will be three reasons, there are three words, there's an A, a B, and a C, and I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, when I cycle through those things. Um, I want to be a bit self-indulgent uh, because uh, I did just curate an exhibition uh, that started, uh, that opened uh, on the 5th of November at Yale. Um, and I uh, like architects, uh, or I want to be like an architect in a way and show my work, right? So that it, it's a it will be a terrific treat for me to sort of flip the slides and say, and then we did that. Uh, and then we did that. Um, you, you, we'll get to that part. Um, there are three things that I, I, that I want to talk about. Um, one of them um, is why are we interested in Dutch architecture if we are today? What are the, what are the real conditions under which we seem to have this interest? Um, and we all seem to be. There have been a lot of Dutch things around here, but there uh, are even more uh, on, the, on the East Coast. There is an obsession with Dutch architecture, especially young Dutch architects today. Um, I think there's also a certain amount of, uh, of animosity developing around the Dutch, uh, in part, I think, driven by a certain, um, um, how would I say this? Um, well, we're jealous because they have a lot of money, uh, right? <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about why, the, why Dutch architecture today. I also want to talk about research uh, in a more uh, serious and fundamental way than the research that was conducted which produced my image, but research nonetheless. Uh, I also, uh, the third thing I want to talk about is uh, this exhibition called Big Soft Orange. Um, uh, as I said, that was, that opened uh, about two weeks ago now uh, at Yale. Um, and I want to be especially self-indulgent there. Uh, and I'll show you, actually, I'll show you our beautiful Big Soft Orange poster. Uh, which is actually a catalog. And one of, the, one of the reasons I want to be sort of self-indulgent is that I don't have enough to give everybody one. So I'm going to read a little bit from the text, and I hope you'll bear with me. Not at the moment, but when we get to that third thing. Um, so, uh, so I'll begin with the first thing, which, of course, has three parts. Um, and I want to begin really uh, with this question of why Dutch architecture today and what, what is its relevance and what is its, uh, what is, what is its importance. Um, I want to start with, uh, uh, with the big. Um, this, uh, this is a uh, part of the new map for the Netherlands drawn up uh, in 1994 and 1995. Um, it, um, it details uh, the VNEX operation, uh, which is the fourth uh, special report on planning in the Netherlands, 
which requires that 1,100,000 new dwellings be built by the year uh, 2005. Um, there's an incredible need for housing, of course, uh, uh, not of course, but in Holland, uh, because of uh, uh, recent immigration patterns and because of population shifts. Um, and this incredible uh, new uh, need of 1,100,000 houses uh, really uh, focuses uh, the interest on quantity. Big is about quantity. It's not about big building. It's about this immense number of houses that need to be developed. This VNEX operation is not a plan exactly. It's policy. Um, and there's a color-coded uh, legend that I don't have, but you wouldn't be able to read anyway because it's in Dutch. Uh, it, what the, 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 the areas correspond, especially around the red and the orange, uh, correspond to new uh, housing areas, especially around major cities. Um, um, and we'll get, I'll rehearse this big soft orange thing again when we get to the exhibition. But um, for the moment, I, I really want to talk about these three conditions. So the big really uh, is about quantity. Um, the soft, on the other hand, uh, this is a, a, a town planning diagram done by OMA for one of their uh, uh, French new towns. Um, this really details what, I, what I'm calling the soft, uh, which is a kind of a planning approach in which the solution is not to create architecture, but to create the conditions under which architecture itself might be created. This is a familiar sort of refrain of OMA's work, um, of Rem Koolhaas's and OMA's work. Um, it's part of a, a larger sort of series of strategies where they often suggest that doing nothing, that is putting no architecture in, is perhaps the most important and sort of daring architectural solution. Um, uh, the soft approach really is one uh, which focuses more on steering and redirecting um, uh, than it does on, uh, on actually building objects. Um, and uh, it also focuses on, as Rem often says, riding the wave and inflecting its movements like a surfer. Um, this is uh, an image. Well, this is the orange, obviously. It's big and it's not entirely soft, but it looks soft. This is an image of a T cell being uh, attacked by an opportunistic virus. It comes also from small, medium, large, extra large, uh, as to both the uh, previous slides. Um, the orange really refers to uh, a, 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 an interesting new uh, commercial interest that's developed in Holland. Um, and uh, it, it refers in some ways to uh, Holland Incorporated, Holland Inc. Holland as a, comp as a country really understood as a larger sort of corporate entity. Um, um, the orange really refers to this famous, this new famous Dutch third way. Uh, which is a new economic and planning model uh, that mediates between uh, what, what French banking official Michel Albert calls, um, or between these two things, uh, which he calls the welfare, uh, the, uh, the Rhine model, which is a welfare state model, uh, predominant primarily, uh, predominant in Germany, uh, Holland, uh, France, uh, Italy, and uh, Sweden, uh, and the more sort of open-ended free market Anglo-American model. Uh, the Dutch model is a kind of a third model which mediates these two and uh, is offering um, really, I think, one of the most interesting attempts to uh, redirect sort of the state planning models uh, in ways that can uh, address a lot of the issues uh, that are arising uh, in the global marketplace. Um, one of the things that, that has resulted from this orangeness, from this new kind of commercial reality in Holland, um, is the national marketing of young Dutch architects themselves. Uh, or it's, um, here, I think you had an exhibition last year of the nine plus uh, one, 10 young Dutch architecture offices, which was uh, sponsored in large measure, I think, by the Dutch government. It's part of this uh, Holland Inc. Uh, policy. Um, and it's a very curious new development. I think, as, as I said, it's, it, 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 it's partly responsible for some of the backlash against uh, young Dutch architects. So those are the three, I, I think, those big, soft, and orange, uh, this emphasis on quantity, this emphasis on uh, a soft approach, um, and this emphasis on this new commercial reality, I think those are the real reasons 
that we're interested in Dutch architecture, it's particularly young Dutch architects today, uh, and not so much um, uh, that we want to know what else is happening in Holland besides Rem Koolhaas. I think there are real sort of economic, political, and social reasons that we have an interest there. Um, I want to move on to my sort of second uh, point, which is really uh, about research. And I want to um, just r uh, cycle through a little text here. In a recent Al Crookies article uh, entitled A World Full of Holes, uh, critic and architect Alejandro Zeropolo sets out to draw a map of contemporary architecture just as did Charles Jenks in the late 1970s. But Zaro Polo proposes a map that is more instrumental, one which allows us to act and not simply to locate ourselves or others on an architectural style sheet. Zaro Polo thus proposes to draw a map of contemporary architecture which focuses on practices of architecture and not on styles of architecture. One which focuses on research and information as pragmatic tools of architectural practice and not as forms of representation or figuration. This, I think, is an important distinction and one that guides my own work and research. Um, under the influence of globalization and new computer, techno uh, computer and technological, uh, I'm sorry, te um, telecommunicational technologies, the practice of architecture is today undergoing fundamental changes. Weary from the side effects of globalization, we alternate between a fascination with Rem Kohlhaus's generic city, which promises a world of scraped, a world scraped of architecture as we know it, and the comfort of Kenneth Frampton's critical regionalism, where a mystical sense of place dominates the landscape. You'll recognize those first two as um, the Dutch landscape uh, and Japan. Um, this, of course, is from Generic City. One of the side effects of globalization is that today we know more than we ever did about architects from around the world. Thanks to a ANU, El Croquis, Space Korea, Arcus, Arc Plus, and a host of others, we have so much information on so many architects that we feel as though there are no longer any shared architectural projects or concerns. The complexity and diversity of information that defines our contemporary situation demands that we make research one of our primary tools of architectural practice. And one of the most important for forms of architectural research, especially in schools of architecture, is research into the varied and constantly shifting field of architectural practice itself. I mean, my, one of my contentions is that uh, not only should one research a project very carefully, but one should also research literally the field of architectural practice itself. Uh, because that field literally is part of the ground on which uh, one operates today. My own work in the last two years has focused precisely on researching emergent practices of architecture, drawing up typologies of these new practices and, and comparing them both with each other and with their immediate predecessors. Like Zara Polo, I, I would uh, suggest we must all um, become historians of the near past so that we will be able to work as centrists, or scenario makers of the near future. Accordingly, what I'd like to do uh, um, this evening is to talk a bit uh, about my own uh, recent work and uh, to talk about it in relationship uh, to this larger uh, set of concerns that I laid out, uh, big, soft, um, and orange. Um, over the last year or so, uh, most of the work I've been doing really has to do have a, yeah, problem. Um, I would ask perfunctory questions like, can you hear me, or is everything okay out there, but I won't do that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the research I've been conducting over the last, uh, over the last two years really has to do uh, precisely with this uh, notion of architectural practice. Um, I've been trying to sort of shift my own interest and, and shift the architectural discourse's interest away from, uh, from style and even from ideology uh, and to focus instead on um, really what I want to call the interiority and the exteriority of architectural practice itself. Um, a lot of the research I've been doing begins with what I take to be the last exhibition and the last moment of the architectural avant-garde, which is the decon 
the deconstructivist show, uh, which was uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in 1988. Um, and a lot of the, uh, 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 the research I've been doing has to do um, uh, with two extreme uh, positions or, or practices of architecture that emerge out of that show. There are, of course, very interesting uh, uh, and quite important offices that were represented in that show, but my own interest are in the two uh, most extreme forms that emerge, and those are Peter Eisenman uh, and uh, Rem Kohlhaus. Um, oh, there they are. Um, sorry. <laughs> In this research, I've sketched two very different faces or facets of, contemporary of the contemporary architectural avant-garde. An American face, which you'll uh, recognize on the left there, most often associated with the work of Peter Eisenman, which looks into architecture's formal essence. Uh, and a Dutch face, which looks out in order to discover architecture's relationship to a new practice of urbanism. What should be understood from the outset, however, is that Dutch and American are not national architectural categories, but are rather to be understood as dispositions or characters uh, toward the practice of architecture uh, itself. Um, what I want to suggest is that Eisenman uh, has pursued uh, an avant-garde course in which experimentation is always registered formally. He's interested in what he calls the interiority of architecture, its essential architecturalness, which is always expressed formally and with respect to typological precedent. Um, this is a slide of, uh, well, you can read those so you know. Um, I'll cycle through a couple of these Eisenman things. The point is that Eisenman's research, from whatever source, from Chomsky, from deconstruction, from Lacanian psychoanalysis, soliton waves, whatever, it always gets registered and, I mean, in form as a kind of formal operation. Now, Kohlhaas, on the other hand, I would suggest, has pursued, pursued a different uh, avant-garde course, which is driven not so much by formal, in, uh, formal innovation, though it is about research and experimentation, uh, as it is by analysis, which reveals constraining, though paradoxically liberating logics, such as the culture of congestion, or those set up by formal devices, such as the Manhattan Grid, which uh, we see here in delirious New York. Now, I have... Um, as I said, I've, I've been working on uh, this project for a while. I, I did a, a seminar at Columbia. I'm doing a seminar at Columbia, which is, has now concluded, uh, which kind of follows these two lines of thought uh, more carefully. And I should say that to fill this in fully, one should take up, of course, some of the middle terms uh, in these two extreme positions. I think, Gary, obviously, research on Gary and the line that comes out of there is not only good for my health uh, uh, here, um, but probably a smart thing in general to do. But, but as I said, uh, what, what is really compelling to me about Eisenman, Kohlhaas, um, Eisenman, Peter Eisenman and Rem Kohlhaas is that they define the extremes of uh, practices of architecture that are coming out of this decon show. Um, I've, I've sort of written six essays uh, that will form a book um, that detail these uh, two different lines, one on Eisenman, one on Greg Lynn, which I almost gave as a lecture here, but it's so negative I thought it's time to stop giving that as a lecture, um, and one on Ben Van Berkel. Now you would ask, why is Ben Van Berkel, who is Dutch, in this American line? Um, and it's because, as I try to suggest, this American line is really not so much about national identity or national architecture. It's about a disposition to the practice of architecture. I would submit that, uh, that Van Berkel's work um, it operates under the same kind of formalist conditions that Eisenman's does. Um, if you've seen uh, Van Berkel's uh, Erasmus Bridge, for example, uh, in Rotterdam, it, it is clear that it's a stunningly beautiful and in the end quite functional piece of architecture. Uh, the only problem is that he doesn't need uh, the huge Deleuzian theoretical apparatus that he uses to explain it. It works fine without it, right? Um, the, the point is that, that Van Berkel's, that the relationship between research in Van Berkel's work um, and the production, the architectural production, is very much like Eisenman's. It always gets registered formally. This is what I would argue. Um, now, there's, uh, in, in this sort of Kohlhaus line, there is, uh, I've done an essay on REM. Uh, a couple of things on MVRDV, whom you will know as the 
uh, inheritors uh, of uh, the OMA um, line. Not only are they inheritors, they have just produced, I don't know if it's here yet, but I brought a copy back. Their new book is called uh, Pharmax, uh, and it is a total ripoff of SMLXL. It's slightly smaller, a slightly smaller number of pages. It's red, uh, but, and you'll see when I flip through towards the end, the projects themselves are, uh, th this is a, there's a huge debate about this in Holland right now. Um, you know, is MVRDV REM Coolhouse or is REM Coolhouse MVRDV? So it's, uh, there's a huge sort of complicated thing about that. Um, there's another essay I've done on Stan Allen, who, like Ben Van Berkel, is the sort of pro offers the counterexample. Ben Van Berkel is the Dutch American. Stan Allen is the American Dutch. And the reason for that is that I think Stan's approach to his disposition to the practice of architecture uh, is, is consistent, uh, his, his approach to research and the, and the relationship between the research and the production of the architecture is much more consistent with this sort of coal house line than it is with, um, with this Eisen line. Now, um, on to the extremely self-indulgent part. Um, well, there it is. Um, this is the, uh, the catalog uh, from this exhibition I just curated. Uh, it's going to be traveling around. I, may as well, I don't have an 800 number. Uh, I do have a website, but I forgot it. Um, it's just like Ross Perot. Um, um, it's, uh, it's starting at Yale. It's going to Columbia. It's going to the CCAC in San Francisco, and we'll see where it goes after that. Um, I think it's an exciting and interesting show uh, um, for a number of reasons. Um, I can tell you a little bit about the conceit of the exhibition. Um, it, uh, it really is about, uh, well, in Holland, as I tried to suggest earlier, there um, are uh, these areas that have been designated as part of this 1,100,000 new dwelling uh, sort of scheme. Um, one of the largest areas uh, designated for the production of new housing is an area called Leitzer Rhein, which is outside of Utrecht. Um, it's to be an extension of 30,000 new houses. And uh, it was designated, I think, in 1994. Um, there was a project uh, architect uh, appointed uh, to hire a design team. Uh, they hired uh, an, archi an architecture office called Max One. I think Rihanna uh, McKink was here last year from that office and gave a lecture. They developed the master plan uh, for this 30,000 house scheme. and. Um, which is now sort of in operation and is functional and is driving um, uh, the work that's going on there. there uh, they are one of the offices in the exhibition. Um, there are three more offices, all of whom uh, have done work inside the larger sort of confines of the Lights of Rhine uh, scheme. Um, uh, one of these offices is an office called Crimson. It's a young office of architectural historians um, who developed the master plan in conjunction with Max. And I want to talk a little bit about them as well. Uh, there's another office called One Architecture, uh, who uh, not only are interesting architects, but who have uh, published, I think, over the last 10 years, really the only interesting Deleuzian architecture magazine called Wieder Hall. Um, then there is also uh, an office uh, represented in the exhibition called NL. Uh, I think Mark Linneman was here last year and lectured uh, on their work. And he may have even shown uh, slides of this uh, WAS 8 building, which is now completed and I saw last week uh, in the mud. Um, now, the exhibition, was, 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 uh, the exhibition is interesting for a number of reasons, I think, uh, not just because uh, these, you know, it's another uh, grouping of these young Dutch architects. It's interesting in that way, uh, but it's also interesting because um, this is one of because the VNEX sites are not only about a huge quantity of new housing, uh, but they are also uh, the sites on which Holland is really beginning to, to sort of deconstruct or take apart its old uh, state planning uh, uh, initiatives and where developers and the market is beginning to impinge. Seventy percent of the housing developed of this 30,000 have to be privately developed. Now, this is not a choice, and it's not a matter uh, that one takes a position on. It simply is going to happen. Um, and one of the really interesting things about a lot of these new young offices is that there's almost a, a kind of an age divide uh, over this issue of the market and how it gets played out. If you're 40 and over, 
uh, you don't like it. Um, if you're 40 and under, you, you do like it, and you actually get a lot of work. Um, it, it, it really comes almost down to a kind of an idea, to an ideological position. A lot of these young offices are interested in the market, right? They don't believe in ideology. They don't believe in politics. They don't. They're, they're like a lot of people in the 90s. Now, I'm not. I don't want to look at that uncritically, but it's a phenomena, and I think it's part of a larger kind of global phenomena that is worth looking at. So, there's that that's going on there. Um, um, then there's just uh, you know there's also the fact that um, that the area is part of this larger sort of planning authority, um, and uh, well, it is part of this larger sort of Dutch uh, 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 charge. I, I, I guess is the only way to say it. But um, what I should say one of the most surprising things, uh, uh, surprising, disappointing, and even a bit disturbing. Uh, is that the exhibition was held at Yale, and uh, Robert Stern loved it. Um, now, we didn't really expect this, um, but it raises a lot of interesting issues about this whole sort of market thing. Uh, I mean, we've, we saw uh, Jerdy here a couple of weeks ago, and we had a, a seminar at the Berlaga, uh, with the Berlaga students uh, at the end of that week, and I actually proposed you know, the, the question, uh, how alike or dislike are offices like Jurdy's and OMA's, or how alike or dislike are those kinds of approaches to the kind of critical positions that people like Michael Sorkin have offered in local code. I mean, there are some really weird and interesting new hybrid phenomena, I think, that are out there today. And the fact that Stern was interested uh, in this exhibition, I think, is really good evidence of that. I should also report to the higher authorities here that I, I put SciArc in, in good stead because the last thing that Stern, of course you know that Stern uh, is the, the new uh, dean at Yale and um, um, one of the things that he seems uh, particularly pleased to do is to uh, distance himself uh, from his previous employer uh, which was Bernard Chumi. Um, so during the uh, discussion I had suggested that there was a certain kind of avant-garde resident at Columbia, and one of the last comments that Stern made was to disabuse me of that idea. Uh, he said, well, you know, I, I think it's a very interesting idea you have, Michael, but, uh, but now, uh, now that I'm here, of course, um, the avant-garde at Columbia really, you know, it doesn't, it's not important, it doesn't exist anymore, that's really not. And of course the crowd, you know, everybody is trying to get in Bob Stern's pocket and everything, and so the crowd laughed and hooped it up and everything. Um, and I just stood there for a minute and I said, well, you know, I can't let that go without comment. Um, as you might know, you, although you probably don't, I was just appointed director of graduate studies at SciArc, and uh, we'd like to think that, in fact, the avant-garde is resident out with us in Southern California. Right. <laughs> and I got an equally uh, positive response, and Stern himself was even pleased, so pleased that, and this is even more disturbing, after, after the exhibition, he came up to me and said, what is your name again and what is your job? <laughs> so, so anyway, they, they know who we are now. Now, I've already taken uh, 25 or 30 minutes and I, I wanted to read a bit of uh, this text um, um, from the exhibition catalog, as I said, because I'm not going to give you one. Um, if it becomes too boring, uh, I'll just stop, and if it goes too long, I'll stop. But I'll cycle through some slides, and we'll see some nice images. Um, and they're not mine. I mean, they're. I should also tell you that we, I'm so I'm thankful to Margie Reeve uh, for saving me uh, at the last minute. My slides I left in Holland, and I had to scramble uh, on a super duper 24-hour rush. It cost me a million dollars to get slides made. These are not my original slides, but I think I think they will be. Uh, I hope they'll be in it, but interesting. Um, so let, let me start with the, with the past. Yeah, we recognize that. Um, Dutch architecture has become as important at the end of the 20th century uh, as it was at the beginning of the century. Perhaps more importantly, it is as responsible for developing a new approach to contemporary moderni modernity as it was in helping to initiate the heroic period of modern architecture. Following in the wake of Rem Koolhaas's emergence, as one of the most influential architects in the world today, 
a host of young Dutch architecture offices are now themselves gaining worldwide attention. Like Coolhouse, these offices are interested in the big. They focus, however, not on the big building, though they are certainly fascinated by its potential, but on the possibilities offered by exploiting a new emphasis on quantity in the Netherlands and elsewhere in the world today. That is not supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> as a result uh, of VNEX, the fourth report on physical planning in the Netherlands, the Dutch government has mandated that 1,100,000 new, new dwellings be built by the year 2005. This is qualitatively, uh, I'm sorry, this is quantitatively equivalent to the entire post-war reconstruction effort in Holland. Such a turn to the big has necessitated the development of a new disposition toward the practice of architecture. There is, among many of these young Dutch offices, for example, a de-emphasis on the kind of aestheticized form generation that dominated architecture in the 1980s and 1990s. And now you know that that's where that slide goes, right? There's a de-emphasis on this kind of form generation. This, of course, uh, this of course is um, Kopemo Blau's um, pavilion uh, in the Groninger Museum in the north of Holland. Um, I'm not sure how many people have seen that. It's sitting on a bed of Mendini uh, flowers. Or it's really quite beautiful. Um, this is Frank Gehry's, uh, uh, the tale of Frank Gehry's fish house uh, in um, Kobe. I don't know if it's actually, I don't know if it survived the earthquake. I, I suspect it probably did. In any case, th there's a de-emphasis on this kind of uh, form production and an obsessive interest uh, in a, a kind of renewed emphasis on the analysis and manipulation of material and immaterial processes, logics, and codes. Indeed, the growing importance of scenario pr planning, profiling, as well as other temporally based steering mechanisms signals an emergent soft approach to the practice of architecture prevalent among most of these young offices. It was this soft approach which guided the Rotterdam-based Max One office in their master plan for Leitzer Rhein, a development of over, of over 30,000 houses near the city of Utrecht, which is to be completed by the year 2015. This is an, uh, an image of the master plan of the model. It is humongous. I think it is six by five meters, uh, and it's made of plexi, and it's usually uh, displayed uh, with uh, black lighting, which it is here in this photograph by Hans Verleman, who did all of the pho photography for SMLXL. In collaboration with Crimson, an office of architectural historians also based in Rotterdam, Max One focused on what they called orgware, or organizational wear, a term borrowed from economics that refers to administrative and other policy-related factors which organize the implementation of ideas, or software, and the deployment of physical elements, hardware. You'll know that this soft approach really, as you can see, is an interest in looking to the exterior of architecture looking to the conditions under which architecture are produced and not focusing so much on architecture itself. Analyzing and making use of orgware. I should say orgware is the competing term in Holland for MVRDV's datascapes. You probably will know something about datascapes. Datascapes is, is really the practice of taking data, driving it through a very rigorous kind of series of analyses, and using it to literally produce architectural form. Orgware is a competing term that's developed by Crimson and Max, which are, they're these sort of little subgroups. Um, and it, it's much more about policy. Analyzing and making use of orgware, Crimson and Max argue, is the only way to steer and direct a plan of such immense size and duration, and one 70% of which will ultimately be controlled, not by the state, but by the market. 21,000 of the 30,000 new houses must be privately developed. Max One's interest in a more dynamic, soft urbanism is thus not driven by a set of political or philosophical directives, but by a market economy dominated by the concern for quantity, the new driving force of urbanism from Utrecht to Singapore. Having discovered the orgware of Venex, uh, and these are just images, uh, smaller images of the model, um, Max One and Crimson developed their own 
in the form of indices, in the form of a, a whole sort of new language which they've developed. Now, I, I, I won't really have time to explain these, but they develop a whole series of indices uh, which refer to building regulations, boundaries, a thing they call person space index. Um, um, that's partly what this is. Uh, mixture, distribution, program, and a thing they call ox factor. The, the, the point is, um, in a plan this huge and that takes so long to develop, um, there's a necessity to, uh, to generate a very strong, uh, um, 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 how would I say this, a, a, very, a very strong plan uh, that can mediate a whole range of different sort of competing interests but one that's soft enough and flexible enough to accommodate over a 25 year period a whole lot of market conditions and a whole lot of housing and other kinds of uh, conditions that simply can't be predicted. So, so the idea really is to take a, a lot of what we now understand to be chaos theory and other kinds of sort of uh, nonlinear models uh, into serious uh, account, uh, but to do it in a very straight up and pragmatic kind of way. These are just more images uh, of, uh, of orgware, as they call it. Um, now, having discovered the orgware of VNEX, which uh, is this huge map that I started with, they began to develop their own. Uh, for, um, for max uh, density, unlike with MVR to V, density and other traditional urbanistic concerns have been reformulated and re-entered into a new kind of calculus. Uh, dictated more by opportunity than by obligation. They write, density is defined as the number of square meters a single individual has at his or her disposal. That is, the number of square meters divided by the number of people rather than the surface area divided by the built floor area. Uh, Farmax is uh, MVR to V's, I'm sorry for all these letters, but that's, it's, it's, they did it, I, I didn't really do this. Um, uh, Farmax is, uh, is, is, is a principle which drives this uh, MVR to V's book and drives their practice of architecture. Uh, and, and the argument is that you can produce incredible density in certain places to be able to save um, sort of the green heart uh, or the natural uh, landscape in other places. There's, a, it, it, there's an obsessive argument about densification and about uh, maximum use of space um, that is contrary to uh, this use that Max is trying to make uh, of space here. Um, here as elsewhere in the plan, individual choice and freedom are not attached to or confined by architecture. They're really not interested in making architecture proper, but really in creating the conditions under which architecture are produced. Um, uh, but form and architecture does not disappear altogether as a concern. It simply becomes one factor among many others. These are just more orgware uh, drawings. Acknowledging the impossibility of predicting uh, how the market will transform such a huge chunk of the program, 70%, Max One reintroduces form as powder, as a field of opportunities that they insist will help retain the coherence of the scheme over time without it becoming a kind of gelatinous colored blob as it seems to appear on these images, on a map of predetermined choices and possibilities. What they're trying to do is to create a kind of an open-ended feedback loop of a plan that's driven by policy and by larger sort of external factors and not by a rigid typological or formal device. So they're trying to take advantage, they're trying to accommodate a lot of the sort of new interest in statistics and in sort of external concerns and not uh, have the plan be uh, driven entirely by, um, by form. Uh, and yet they do, uh, they do themselves uh, uh, develop form. This is a, this is a series of, um, of 26 bridges that they're developed. They were to originally to develop more than 200 bridges for this. Um, and they have made these bridges really pieces of architecture. It's a really uh, quite an amazing and quite a beautiful uh, set of bridges they've made. Um, there are a lot of things to say about these bridges, and I, I don't want to say too much. We can talk about this maybe later. Um, they go against almost every rule of Dutch bridge planning uh, that one can imagine. For example, as you can see, uh, um, the bicycle path crosses in, over the, um, the, uh, the, the, the auto uh, traffic, um, uh, which could uh, cause, obviously, um, harm. Um, <laughs> 
there, uh, uh, part, part, of, uh, part of the strategy that, part of the strategy that th this office and NVRDB employ are to determine the constraints that are laid down by Dutch policy and work and push those constraints to such a degree that they actually produce new kinds of solutions. And that's, this is one of those sorts of results. So part of this powder uh, is a series of 26 bridges that Max uh, has just completed, some of which um, uh, I'll show tonight. Um, because the canal waters of this area, the slides are Rhine, cannot be navigated by large boats, the bridges are all stationary with non-liftable uh, spans. This is another uh, of the bridges. You can't see this very well, and it's really uh, quite an awful thing, but um, it, it, as a kind of a dig to the planning authorities, they have a, you can't really see it, there's a dead baby, uh, a dead child floating uh, in, um, uh, under one of those bridges. Uh, as I said, it's not a, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not a particularly uh, sort of wonderful thing, but it, it is part of this interest in pushing and making fun of the planning authorities. Because the canal waters of Leitzer Rhine cannot be navigated by large boats, the bridges are all uh, stationary with non-liftable spans. This constraint on the waterway, however, uh, opened a degree of land traffic freedom and allowed Max One considerable flexibility in designing according to road and motorway layout. Now, this is part of a larger interest they have. When they first were offered the master plan, they were told that traffic really was not part of the plan itself, that they had to plan the housing, uh, and that traffic would be taken up by another authority. Uh, and there was a huge argument that they had to sort of uh, make to be able to actually uh, affect the traffic patterns. Well, of course, the traffic patterns in this development are one of the most significant sort of features of the plan itself. And they, so, so they began to approach the traffic pattern itself as an architectural problem, and that's how these bridges emerged. Um, this resulted in remarkable bridge hybrids in which, for example, two bridges joined together then separate according uh, to traffic requirements. It should be noted that all 26 of these bridges uh, are quite beautiful. They are so, however, and this is really important uh, in uh, terms of drawing this distinction between these two lines of thought, the Eisenman formalist and the Kohlhaas sort of more open-ended performative. Um, uh, these are beautiful, however, not because of their intrinsic formal qualities, but because of the elegant vehicular and pedestrian ballet that they script and perform on a daily basis, or that they will script and perform on a daily basis. Operating more like parallel processing traffic units, it is the soft but insistent coaxing and massaging of traffic flows that makes these bridges infinitely more important than the hyper-designed uh, signature bridges that have been cropping up all over Holland uh, that, 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 in fact, were led by Ben, uh, ben Van Berkel's bridge. Um, I should just say that there, there are, so, so they've developed a whole typology uh, of these bridges. The first 26 are being completed. Uh, it, it appears they're now gonna get the commission to do uh, at least 26 more, and by the end, I think they'll probably will have done uh, almost 200 of these. Um, th th there's another thing that's interesting about them. Uh, they are done uh, in an incredibly cheap way, so as at another level to recoup, I don't know if you can see them, these stainless steel bars, um, which are so incredibly anti-Dutch. I mean, uh, the bridge itself is very Dutch. It's cheap, it's functional, it's pragmatic, it's straight up. Uh, but I think, I think the budget for the railings was almost as much as the production of the bridge itself. They're really exquisite. But it, it, again, it's part of this needling and pushing the logic um, um, of the codes and the larger authorities. Now, the most poignant and indeed the most profound example of what I'm calling the soft approach. However, uh, uh, examples are to be seen in the current work of Crimson, which is the office that helped to do the master plan um, with uh, Max One. The current work that they're conducting on the orgware implications of Rotterdam Harbor and its surrounds. While this work is not officially part of the Lights Orion plan, it does extend Crimson's orgware analyses in such a way that over time, the results will be fed back into the Lights Orion plan to allow continued adjustment and alteration. Without being overly theoretical, one can say that Crimson and Max One have built into the master plan a temporally based feedback design mechanism that allows the plan to adapt to new conditions as though it were itself uh, a form of urban life. 
Crimson has pursued its research into the relatively unknown territories seen only by those attentive to what they call orgware, because, as they write, only there will the soft, immaterial, hybrid urbanism necessary to actively intervene in the contemporary metropolis be found. Now, their argument about orgware is that um, uh, it is a policy-driven uh, space that is never seen by the urban planners, by the architects, or even by the larger sort of officials uh, because it exists in this kind of nether zone, this sort of weird in-between world that no one really considers urban. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. This is an area that they call purple haze, uh, which is precisely one of these areas that is completely overlooked um, by, uh, by the harbor authorities, by the city of Rotterdam, and by, by architecture entirely. They say, they write, somewhere between the besieged territories of urbanism and the immense arteries and non-civic territories of the conurbation lay the hunting grounds for another urbanism. It is here that we find the most maddening sedimentations of power disguised as powerlessness and the most exciting collection of possibilities disguised as impossibilities. Between the clear-cut territory of the refinery and the middle-class neighborhood lay areas that do not derive their logic and filling from one single authority or owner, but from the fact that they are filled to the brim with the political, functional, and physical leftovers of the city. In several projects, uh, uh, Crimson uh, have discovered zones of what you could only call planned urban irresponsibility. Uh, and this is one. Uh, this, is a, a, this, is, um, a, um, this is called a toleration prostitution zone in the city of Rotterdam. Um, they've discovered these zones of planned urban responsibility where illicit sex and drug trafficking fed by the seemingly irreconcilable forces of Calvinism and mercantilism, are left to fester into new urban forms and typologies, such as the toleration zones for street prostitution. These urban exotica, now the amazing thing is they're incredibly mundane. They're, they're, there is nothing special about these when you see them. Um, the weird thing is they are not to be found on any of the planning authorities' uh, maps. They're not represented anywhere, and yet they are actually funded as an official, unofficial part of Dutch policy. These urban exotic are forms of urban planning that are officially unplanned and indeed take no recognizable cartographic or official representational form because they exist only after dark and function only to siphon off petty criminality that would otherwise make life unpleasant for the, for the average citizen. Um, what, the way this thing actually works is, uh, I think the, uh, the prostitutes uh, and uh, sort of line up over here. Uh, the Johns sort of drive in, uh, they drive around, they pick one up and they drive back out. Now this, there's actually a building that we don't see at the other end of this. This is literally funded uh, by the city and it's funded so as to, to keep um, these so-called undesirables away from the newly developing shopping areas. Now, so Crimson's analysis and Crimson's interest uh, is in doing a kind of research in these nether zones that are, are completely unseen by these larger sort of overlapping policy uh, uh, authorities um, and to really begin to intervene in those in, I think, interesting kinds of ways. Uh, their most recent work focuses on how municipal authorities, urbanists, and architects can actively intervene in this newly discovered orgware landscape. They're not very sanguine, for example, about the kind of work that MVRDV do. Uh, and the reason they're not is that MVRDV, in their estimation, pick and choose the nice research. They pick and choose the nice data. It's this stuff that people don't really look at, and it's this stuff that really um, um, deserves probably the closest sort of attention by these new kinds of data scapings and analytical researchers. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, Crimson, a lot of Crimson's work has, has recently been to develop a whole new set of languages that mediate between architects and urban planning and um, um, uh, larger sort of uh, municipal and state authorities. And part of that language uh, I sort of showed you earlier in these, in these diagrams. I'm going to move along. Um, these are, these are, this is also, this is another sort of uh, larger, this is uh, Rotterdam Harbor. This is a larger uh, sort of um, image of uh, these orgware areas that they've, uh, that they've developed. 
Another of these young offices um, uh, is the Bureau Shki, uh, and, and they are fascinated uh, by the immaterial logics and movements of commerce, especially those that shape our view of the city. They focus on what uh, Fred Jameson calls cognitive maps, those everyday images of the city we carry around in our heads, its borders, overlaps, points of intensity, opportunity, etc. Though they are at work now on some of their first architectural design projects, the ski uh, is best known for a series of maps, including the monumental new map. The first thing that I showed, they are actually responsible for uh, of the Netherlands, uh, a gargantuan cartographic undertaking which attempts to visually portray the orgware of an entire nation. Like all maps, it offers the illusion of control of a total view from above uh, of an identity, but its very existence also gives the lie to such an identity to the unified state planning approach assumed in such cartographical enterprises. For what will occur on this map, as in the Rotterdam, as, in Ro as it does in Rotterdam Harbor, will no longer simply be a political matter for the Dutch, but will be a commercial matter for the global market. This is an argument that Crimson makes as well, which is that one of the reasons that the, the harbor authority is often overlooked by the city uh, is that the harbor is really part of a much lar larger sort of global network of container traffic uh, and shipping, uh, which, which extends the harbor itself, literally, uh, beyond the physical confines uh, of the harbor and makes it part of, a of an immense uh, um, uh, sort of harbor authority uh, and uh, a flow mechanism that, that, that is global and that really has nothing to do with the city. Unlike the new map, uh, Ski's other cart cartographies are more polemical, uh, such as the, the projects uh, in which they reduce the entire Randstad, the ring cities uh, in Holland, uh, in the west of Holland, which include Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague, to a single urban agglomeration. Theirs is an urbanism which makes visible a new global city divided into sectors, harbor, cultural, and governmental, each dominated by an already existent metropolitan area. Rotterdam, Amsterdam, The Hague, respectively. Perhaps uh, their most provocative map is one in which each, and it's this one, uh, in which each of the major cities of the Randstad, with their own historical identities to protect, is reduced uh, to a subway stop on a large metropolitan Randstad subway system, which is sort of what you see here. Commenting on this new urban world global city phenomena, uh, Lucas Verwig uh, of, uh, of the Ski observes, a city used to be a place which had been granted a city charter, but that concept no longer works. Now one thinks more in terms of size, populations, figures, and commerce. So the idea here is to look really at the whole of the west of Holland as one big city, and each of the cities are, subway, are stops on a large sort of subway. As with Max, one quantity has taken on new meaning in the work of Ski. Uh, Ski is now researching urban flow phenomena such as, this is that same map, such as traffic jams, um, which they argue offer the opportunity for rethinking how we may more profitably and enjoyably spend leisure time in our cars and on the motorways. Um, they're now, in fact, weirdly enough, uh, devising schemes for making use of traffic accidents and traffic blockages, and they're actually they're being paid by the government to do this. Um, it, it's sort of reminiscent, I don't know if any of you have read uh, J.G. Ballard's novel, Cocaine Nights, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible sort of no, urbanistic novel. Uh, it's one in which um, um, a number of sort of um, uh, little uh, resort communities in uh, the south of Spain uh, have put a lot of money uh, in, uh, into uh, recreational activities and all other sorts of things to, uh, for retirees, and they start to fail because there's no life in the community. So the larger sort of planning authorities for, uh, for the resorts introduce crime uh, as a way uh, to make the city alive and interesting again. And before you know it, the area is booming. People are moving in, the, the, you know, the, the, the retail areas start booming again. So th th they have a similar kind of weird interest in making use of things like traffic accidents, uh, traffic blockages, um, and other kinds of things that would normally be understood as uh, debilitating, but they imagine are conditions of possibility. All of their uh, projects are serious urban interventions, but, uh, but as this example suggests, they're also playful, even a bit cheeky. Um, the ski power advertising flyers, which simulate supermarket flyers, for example, offer wonderful and inventive ecological solutions to design problems 
without being too heavy handed. Now this is one that they call wandering houses um, and I've always wanted to use a pointer so I'll do that tonight. Um, I don't know if you can, I guess I'll have to do it the other way. I obviously don't know what I'm doing. Um, they, they, they produced a really sort of interesting solution here. There are a series of islands. I can't for my life now remember exactly where they are. I think they're Dutch territories. Uh, but these islands literally wander. They move. They're called wandering islands. Um, and they, uh, the ski was commissioned to come up with a way of creating uh, housing for, uh, for resort housing for, uh, for these islands um, which were moving. And what they proposed was a series of grids here, uh, um, uh, I'll just sort of read this. Uh, uh, a typical solution might try and stop the erosion of the island before abandoning it altogether. Instead, Ski, and they worked with NL Architects on this, proposed that a row of nomadic houses be built on a grid system, which you see there, and as the island loses landmass on one side, the row of houses situated there are leapfrog over the other houses by truck to the other side. So as it starts to eat away over here, these are moved over here. Right? Now, th thus forming the leading edge of housing as it follows wherever the land leads. Not only are the natural movements of the island and ocean undisturbed, but sooner or later everyone will have beachfront property. <laughs> e as they say, ecology and the market are both satisf satisfied. Now, again, this is a and you can see how they, how they are actually transported here. They sort of they pick them up and drop them. I think wad means wandering. So the island is wandering this way and they're just sort of... Now, again, it, it, it's cheeky, but, but it's part of this weird sort of orange commercial approach, uh, which they take. Uh, and in this approach, they try to accommodate both ecology and this sort of emergent market, which is there and will not go away. Um, now, another related feature of this soft approach is an avowed post-avant-garde attitude accompanied by an acceptance of the market as reality of contemporary architectural and urban practice. I can see that I'm, I'm beginning to go a bit long. Uh, what I'm going to do is, to, uh, is, is rather than uh, uh, do this here, I'm just going to cycle through the images and talk a little bit about the other two offices and then conclude and maybe we can have some sort of questions about this. Um, the other two offices that, uh, that we focused on in the exhibition are NL Architects and One Architecture. This is a, um, uh, these are two projects that NL may have showed uh, when they were here before. This is their famous uh, cheeky little Mazda parking um, scheme where, as you can see, Mazda is spelled out here. Here, instead of paying to park, uh, you're paid uh, like $2.50 an hour because your parking actually spells Mazda, right? So it's a, it's a commercial, and again, it's a kind of a, a cheeky commercial solution to a, this is a, this is a project that they did for, uh, for Amsterdam. Uh, it's called Car Park, it's, it's for a car park. And what the, the idea, although I'm, I'm, sadly, this is one of the slides that I don't have, the idea was that they took a highway and literally folded it up into the most unbelievable contortions. What you don't see is the little image of the man uh, in the jack-in-the-box jumping out, which is what they normally show with this. Um, it's an amazingly inventive project, and it really uh, uh, comes from an obsession that the office has with automobiles and auto culture. Um, you, you can tell with this and with this. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the only uh, uh, finished building that they've done. It's called Waz 8. Um, it's a fabulous little uh, building. It's actually not so small. It's made of sprayed-on polyurethane. Um, it, um, it, the interesting thing about it and how it works in the Lights Orion plan is that it will, like the whole plan, start in one place and like the, uh, like the migrating um, uh, uh, housing scheme, uh, will literally over time find itself in a different location. It starts, its nearest neighbor, you can't see, it will be right here, is this pig that's actually become famous in Holland. So uh, it starts out in a pasture. It's, 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 it's in the middle of nowhere. But this housing will fill in sort of around it over time. Now, the, the, the idea is that it's, it's simply a heat exchange unit. It's just an industrial building. Uh, all they did was to make a square box, spray this polyurethane on, and they did some interesting sort of uh, shapes with it. 
Um, but the idea is that they had to build a building that over time could, would accommodate both its place in the natural sort of landscape where there are pigs and sheep and everything, uh, but that also over 20, 25 years would, uh, would find itself at home in a highly urban, highly vandalizable uh, uh, sort of place. So what they've done here is to try to foresee uh, how one might accommodate that kind of vandalism, and they try to make it sort of vandal proof. One by using this material, but the other by uh, trying to create diversions. These are there's a there's a, on the other side there's a series of, of um, um, rock climbing um, um, apparatuses. Um, there is a basketball goal attached to the other side, and on this side uh, they've used reflectors which spell. W-O-S, you can't quite see it. The, on the other side, actually, and I don't have an image of that, the other side uh, has these uh, climbing pegs everywhere, and it's, it, it is, they're laid out in a, in a kind of a braille form, and they're running a, uh, a contest uh, for people to guess what the, what, the, what the braille actually says. It's a climbing braille. So, in other words, there are these pegs everywhere that you climb on, but it, it literally spells something out in braille. So, um, I'm not sure exactly how one would test, uh, would test the answer, but in any case. This is a project, uh, this is the, third, the, the fourth office that was involved in the exhibition. Um, it's a project called Six Under a Tennis Court, and it's by an office called One Architecture. Um, it's a very odd uh, project in many ways. Um, they're, in some ways, I think the most sort of idiosyncratic and weirdest uh, of all these offices uh, involved in the exhibition. This was a housing scheme uh, done, I think, for 300 houses uh, in the Light to Rhine larger sort of master plan. Um, and their idea, uh, uh, their idea is to take non-design as their design uh, uh, sort of uh, a model. Uh, what they do is they take elements that they find already in the landscape um, and they intensify those and try to transform those and they become part of a larger sort of um, um, uh, design sort of mechanism. I don't want to spend too much time on them. Now, uh, these last couple of slides, I, I, I said earlier that I ha was going to give a lecture on Greg Lynn and resisted, uh, but, uh, but I did have to show some of Greg's um, uh, work and talk about it a little bit here toward, at the end. Um, not only was I uh, off last week uh, opening this exhibition, but I, but I attended a conference uh, in uh, in Delft, in the Netherlands, um, um, which, among other things, featured uh, four really exciting new young architectural practices and offices, all of whom in some ways fit into these two lines of research that I've been trying to sort of outline. Uh, and they were uh, Vinnie Moss of MVRDV, Greg Lynn, um, whose work you see here, uh, Adrian Guz of uh, West 8, um, um, and uh, Alejandro Zaropolo of uh, for an office architects. One of the most interesting things that happened at the conference uh, was uh, that it, 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 it really became clear to me that a number of these young offices have now begun to break with, uh, I think, the avant-garde enterprise that was initiated by Kohlhaas and by Eisenman, and really, I think, are beginning to conduct uh, experimentation and research uh, in a way that is not really interested in producing a new ideological, high modern sort of avant-garde. Um, I think Greg's work, though, the early stuff for me is still completely caught up in the eyes been problematic. This later stuff, uh, I think, is beginning to turn in a different kind of direction. Uh, the weird thing is I was actually most disappointed uh, with, uh, with MVRDV and with Winnie Moss's answers because one of the things that's becoming clear uh, is that the kind of uh, use that uh, NVRDV makes of research, um, while it's really important and is setting, I think, a, a new kind of direction for young offices, um, is very soft. Uh, Vinnie Moss was uh, accused uh, of, in fact, being soft with the research and uh, being particularly soft on the relationship between uh, the data scapes themselves and the forms that were produced. And in fact, there was a question from the, uh, from the audience uh, uh, that suggested that, in fact, their, their images and their bar graphs and everything were not even as good as what the, the member in the audience had seen previously on a McDonald's tea, uh, commercial, a McDonald's hamburger commercial. 
And it was really quite weird in a way because Vinnie Moss had, had no answer to this. The, the, the point about this is simply, the point I'm trying to make, if I am making a point uh, to end on, um, is that uh, this new, uh, this direction uh, of research, I think that we're all very interested in, uh, is incredibly important and incredibly uh, useful uh, f uh, to develop new kinds of approaches to the practice of architecture, uh, practices uh, which require us to look out beyond the sort of formalist kinds of solutions uh, to uh, entertain new relationships with the market, but also to entertain new relationships to political, ideological, and social concerns that we obviously uh, know quite a lot about here, but that other people have forgotten. On the other hand, the research uh, can become in the hands, I think, of uh, the wrong people or uh, in unpracticed hands, uh, can become uh, uh, fetishistic objects. And I'm beginning to wonder if this is not, in fact, what's occurring with a lot of the work of MVRDV uh, and, in fact, with some of these other offices. So as just a cautionary sort of word, uh, despite the fact that I'm in real support of most of these offices and in great support of research, one has to be very careful uh, about the research and how it, what kind of use uh, is made of it because um, if care is not taken, uh, it does become fetishized. Um, that's really it. I, 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 as I said, I wanted to be incredibly self-indulgent, uh, show my own stuff, say that we did this, we did that. Um, um, but I would be very happy if people were interested in taking questions uh, or in ending and we all go home and have fun. Um, whatever, I don't, I don't know what's, uh, oh, will we take questions or, yeah? I, of course, won't be able to see anyone, so you should just, like, scream if you want to ask a question. Are there, are there, well, the first one is always the hardest. Yes, I knew there would be a question. Yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I am especially interested in uh, um, is a very quirky new, uh, and, and this, this follows my interest in this OMA big, soft, orange kind of approach, are, are the kind of uses that can be made of some of these quirky new planning models that are emerging um, out of traditional planning. Uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, Royal uh, Dutch Shell developed uh, a, a new, very interesting, open-ended, non-linear kind of planning approach that they called uh, scenario planning. Uh, and a lot of those people uh, have sort of, after having moved from Shell, have now sort of reformulated in groups around uh, the country. In fact, one is in San Francisco called the Global Business Network, and I think it is one of the most fascinating um, planning uh, outfits uh, anywhere today. Their idea is uh, to, produce, uh, to produce scenarios um, that is sort of future possibilities, not, an, not, an attempt, not in an attempt to determine the direction that one will actually go in. So not to produce a plan, but literally to produce a series of possible futures in the way that Crimson is researching, for example, orgware, the possible futures which are then built back into the plan itself making the plan, I think, work in a much more flexible, open-ended, non-linear sort of way. So uh, unfortunately, most of this research has, is being conducted on corporate structure itself. Most of the really interesting books and most of the interesting people are conducting research uh, on uh, scenario planning on companies. So uh, there's, a, there's, for example, a really important thinker, Ari de Hoos, uh, who started, was really one of the founders of, of, so, of, of scenario planning. Um, he has a really interesting distinction that he makes in a book called A Living Company, between an economic, between what he calls an economic and a living company. Um, obviously, we have life outside there. Um, 
uh, it's a distinction that's, in, that's really, really useful because what he did was to research companies that had a life uh, span of more than 500 years. There are corporations that have lifespans of 500 years or more. It's unbelievable. Um, and he, what he tried to determine was what were the conditions under which these companies lived, right? Uh, what were the conditions under which uh, they continued to live as companies? How did they change over time their structure so that they took in external information or, or were able to change under sort of new conditions, and yet they, re they retained their identity as companies? Um, this kind of research is being conducted, I think, as I said, primarily on companies, but there are some people who are beginning to adapt uh, this kind of, these kinds of models in architecture and in urban planning. And I, I think there's really, really fruitful and fascinating stuff to be done with that. Um, it's a lot of my own work right now is moving in this kind of direction, so that one looks at a city in the same way that these people look at companies and corporate structures, as a, at, literally as a living company. As, an, as a living, breathing organism, uh, which e evolves over, it, which evolves over time, and yet retains its structure as a coherent, identifiable, singular entity. Um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of fruitful stuff to be done, uh, to be done with these models. But again, it's, it's, it, it comes out of this larger kind of Dutch interest in looking to the larger conditions under which architecture are produced, not focusing so much. Uh, on uh, form and form manipulation, formal strategies. Now that that was a plant, right? You know that question was a plant. Uh, so there, so we could have some maybe. No, I'm I'm joking. It was not a plant. Uh, um, are there other questions? Yes. Right, right. Well, the perversity of that, of course, is that uh, that's the hallmark of Cole House's work to begin with. I mean, if you remember, you know, the, the little Colin Rowe story about, uh, you know, the European avant-garde coming to the States, dropping its ideological uh, sort of binding somewhere over the North Atlantic, ending up here primarily as a formalist avant-garde, right? Um, Cole House actually comes sometime later to dispute that by arguing that there, that there was uh, you know, a Native American architectural avant-garde here that had existed for quite some time and in fact was in the end much more important than the formalist avant-garde that Roe and other people were really looking at. And you know, it, it's, not, it's not an avant-garde, however, that's driven by an interest in form or formal analysis. It's an avant-garde uh, which really relies on these larger sort of logics and analyses of things like the culture of congestion, um, of, of, the, of the Manhattan grid, uh, and of, of logics, and of li uh, literally of the conditions under which architecture produced, not so much the formal sort of apparatus of architecture itself. He, of course, takes this research you know, back, as you say, to the new Europe uh, in the form of concepts like bigness, and it's under concepts such as those that almost all of the work that they've produced over the last five or six, or maybe ten years uh, has, has been generated. I mean, there is a weird uh, kind of uh, desire, swapping desire that's going on between the U.S. and Holland. Um, at the very moment, w w you, know, you, go, you go to Rotterdam with the assemblage crowd, right, uh, which I've done a couple of times. And they want to go and see the Vanel factory, which is fine, right? It's beautiful. I mean, there's this terrific, wonderful Dutch modern architecture there. We, have, we lust for this modernist past that seems to be resident, especially in Holland, while they, in fact, lust for this weird sort of Bob Stern commercial kind of world uh, that they find here. A lot of these offices, I mean, it, as it turns out, it's not it's not unusual that Stern likes this work because some of the cutting edge of the work itself is quite commercial 
and accommodates the larger kind of interest that Stern and people like that, and sort of the Disney sort of view of the world have. The difference, however, is that um, I think with these offices and in Holland in general, it is still, it is, it is part of a third model. It is neither the Anglo-American free market model, the one under which Stern operates, nor is it this sort of Rhineish model, the sort of state planning model. It is a new model in which the, the country, the national entity itself, operates as a corporate structure. So the country is a corporate entity. And this works internally in the same kinds of ways. So that you have these strange new hybrids of, of public and private, I think that exist there unlike they do really in many other places today. And it's, it's partly why I think it is an interesting, um, an interesting country to look at. Yeah, you have a follow-up, sorry. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know that there are people doing that in architectural institutes or uh, obviously the big firms are doing this kind of thing. I mean, they, they, they are doing that. But it seems to me that schools of architecture should be taking up these kinds of problems uh, and thinking about them very carefully in rigorous uh, and researched kinds of ways. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm interested in doing. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think there's a lot of it going on yet, but I think that Hopefully, there will be a lot of that going on. Yeah, because he's. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's actually an incredibly good question. And it's a question that the Dutch consulate uh, is, is very curious to figure out. Um, they keep giving, uh, you know, the, the, how would I say this? They have given lots of money over the last five or six years in support of young Dutch architecture, in support of exhibitions, in support of symposia and other kinds of things. But in talking with them and trying to sort of secure funding for this and a couple of other projects, it's clear that they want to figure out how to get the Dutch building over here, right? Um, so they're interested in figuring the thing out the other way around. Now, what's curious is that the conditions on the one hand are radically different. Right? We live in a country where uh, it is very difficult to fund any kind of architectural research. They live in a country uh, that has a national institute of architecture, that has an archive and research money and research fellows. They send 25 young architects to a different spin on the globe every year uh, you know, to, to, to conduct research. I think Bart Losma was through here earlier this year. And I know that, for example, his uh, slide lecture and exhibition was funded entirely by the Dutch government. It is part. It's part of, you know, Holland Inc. Um, how, I mean, so, so the Dutch are interested in that, but I think we should be interested in that too. And part of, part of I think, what connects the projects is this larger kind of interest in the conditions under which architecture are produced, focusing not so much on the very specific kind of formal workings out of these, but really on the sort of feeder cultures, on the externality, on, the, on what Kohlhaas or on what Liz Gross calls the exteriority of architecture. There are, in fact, I think, a number of California-based um, 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 operations that are either about to be announced or that have been announced that are, that are fascinating a number of these offices in the same way that the VNEX thing does. Um, I don't know what these are. I'm actually sort of do, curious to do, begin to do research into this myself. But I think there are a lot of ways that the kind of approach that they take to the practice of architecture is not only useful here, but in fact is already being done by a lot of other people in maybe not so progressive ways. Uh, Duane Plater Zyberg, for example, who are often hammered for being ugly, insidious beasts, um, I think their approach in some ways is really not entirely unlike that of OMA. Um, there are obviously differences between these two offices and differences in the ways that they sort of produce architecture and differences in the kind of solutions they offer. But the approach, I think, is not entirely dissimilar. Um, so I think we can begin to look at, Jerdy was here two, two or three weeks ago. I mean, he started his lecture by saying, we don't do objects. We do uh, armatures and fields. Now, 
one can think what one wants about that. But I think that interest is not entirely unlike the, the, the interest of OMA and of a lot of these young offices. Um, I mean, the kind of solutions that are, that are made uh, may not be the same that these offices would offer, but, but I think the approach is, is, is not that dissimilar. Yes. Uh, you right over here. Uh, no, that's not a question, sorry. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it's, it's a very perverse world in a way because it's one where, I mean, here for example, to be for the market, you can't be, I mean, you can't, or it's very difficult, it would seem to be very difficult to be for the market and progressive. There, it, there because the overriding authority for housing since after the reconstruction has been the state, right? It's the state that has been prohibitive. It's the state that's offered you the money, but it also has provided almost no opportunities for young offices. As the market really begins to sort of move in and dominate new housing and development, new kinds of opportunities are opened up for these young offices that were not opened up, that were simply impossible before, that were bureaucratic, right? I mean, the, the, the opportunities were driven by a bureaucracy. So there's a, there's a kind of a degree of freedom that, has, that the market opens up there which makes for a very strange set of circumstances under which the most progressive offices are in fact the most market savvy ones. So it's a, it's a very different set of circumstances that uh, dominate there than dominate here. And part, that's partly my interest in this. How is it that, that the avant-garde there is market savvy and driven by an interest in aggressively following market trends. And here, a similar kind of an interest would uh, make you not a very interesting creature, right? Or at least if you're a young progressive architect. So the conditions are very different. Uh, uh, and, yet, and, yet, and yet, as you say, a lot of these projects are quite subversive. Uh, they, they, they make attempts to call into question uh, the sort of the, even the, the bureaucracy that's being generated by this new third way. So, so yeah, I mean, it's a, but, but it's a, but it's, but these are two very different kinds of situations. M my interest is, in, is is really in the kind of question that Kazis asked: how to accommodate these two kinds of very different political economic situations, which seem to take or s which seem to produce similar kinds of approaches to the practice of architecture. That's to me. That's what's interesting. Uh, in part because we live in a world in which I mean, ideology doesn't make the same kind of sense anymore. And these are very clear examples uh, of, of the kind of ideological confusion that arises when you have the most progressive architects being market driven in one place and the very opposite in, in, in somewhere else, namely here. Yes. It's, that's a really good question. I mean, what's, what's really peculiar is that you, you, you might have asked it the other way around. You might have asked, what influence do the schools have on these young offices? Almost none. I mean, what's interesting is that OMA has developed such an incredibly important architectural culture in Holland that, how would I say this? Uh, it, they, they were able to develop it in part because what, what's been happening at the schools for the last 10 years is zero. I mean, nothing happens. TU Delft is far and away, you know, the best school of architecture in Holland. It's rated, I think, one of the three or four best schools of architecture in the world. But intellectually, nothing is happening there. I mean, it is, a, it is an absolute wasteland. 
the people who sponsored the conference that I just attended, which had participants like Ed Soja, Saskia Sasson, Scott Lash, Michael Hayes, I mean, really big name people who got paid a considerable amount of money to go, were funded by student organizations uh, that got money from the Dutch government and from private corporations. Uh, there was a sort of a student subculture in these huge universities that fund the most interesting conferences, research, and work that's being done. These offices have almost no relationship to school culture in Holland. They, it, it, there's, a, there's a strange kind of history in Holland. Uh, if, you, if, you, if OMA has defined a new kind of practice, there are a number of offices that have come out of OMA. Um, uh, offices like Max One, offices like MVRDV that have direct connections to OMA. There are a whole series of other architectural offices, however, that have nothing to do with OMA and that, and whose work really, I think, in some ways, is much uh, more like that uh, in the U.S. than it is like, say, OMA or the sort of Dutch approach. People like Ben van Berkel or Will Aerts. Uh, Will Aerts, of course, is the head of, um, of the Berlager. But these, young, these offices that I just showed, in a funny kind of way, are much closer to the kinds of approach of OMA, but they, but no, only two of them really worked very closely with OMA. So I, I didn't really answer your question except to say there's almost no connection between these kinds of approaches and the schools. This approach is really being developed in response to the popularity of OMA. Really, it's it's, it's I mean, OMA is the most important school culture in Holland, far and away. Uh, Neil, yeah. 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 Uh, because there's a, a divestiture of the whole idea of self to the form. So what, what is their kind of cultural uh, makeup as a scene in terms of the idea of progress? Yeah, I mean, th th there's a strange one-upsmanship going on, I think, right now. Um, to, be, to be more like OMA, um, but it, it's not clear what that really means. I mean, in the end, what's important in my estimation about OMA are not the wonderful series of pieces of architecture that they've made. It literally is the approach that they've taken. And it's, it's there in the kind of cleverness of the approach that you begin to see the, the rift between OMA and people in offices like MVRDV. When you see Pharmax, when you see this book and compare it to SMLXL, I, I think it'll be, it'll be really clear where the strength of the vision is. Um, but there are a lot of little sort of small competing offices and uh, groups which are attempting to sort of take up the mantle, kind of take up, uh, take up from where sort of OMA left off. The, the, the problem is, in a way, a lot of it is depend, dependent on this kind of clever one-upsmanship and gamesmanship, brinksmanship, where you try to figure out the rules of the authorities and then produce something sort of interesting and, and, and sort of funny inside that. Um, I don't know where it will go. I mean, my, my, my guess about the whole Dutch scene is that it, it's not going to be a scene for very much longer. I mean, I think it's interesting. I think a lot of things have come out of it. I, I think they have set up, a, a, they have produced a, 
a, a very different and important approach to architecture than has been produced on the West Coast, I mean on the, on the East Coast and the States. Um, and in some ways, I think it's because their work seems so radically different than a lot of the work that comes out of, that comes out of Columbia. I think people have been drawn to it for that reason. In a weird way, I think they're becoming less important because many of these offices, both in Holland and on the East Coast of the States, are beginning to look more and more like each other. I mean, MVRDV and the work that Greg is doing now is not completely dissimilar. Um, and there, I, I think there are a lot of offices that find themselves sort of somewhere in between. If OMA, I mean, if Rem and Eisenman name the two extremes of this thing that come out of the uh, decon show, Chumi is the kind of middle figure. And I think some of the more interesting offices that are emerging on this, sort of, on this sort of young scene are offices that occupy the position that Shumi does. People like foreign office architects. Um, I mean, Zara Polo uh, has the, the beautiful sort of formal inventiveness of Greg's work, but he also has the, I think, the larger kind of interest in data and social, political, cultural conditions. I think those kind of offices will, in the long run, be much more important and more influential. Uh, again, I mean, my, my, my interest in conducting this sort of research on this book was to look at these two extremes as extremes uh, and to see where they started, where they moved, and to see to what extent there was some kind of accommodation of these two extremes. I, I, I do think a, a really interesting set of problems could be set before one if you started to look at the way in which Gary's office develops out of the same set of polarities. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that could sort of could come out of that. But I think the, the most significant thing in the end is that this decon show, in my estimation, was really the last of a kind of an avant-garde, the last attempt to produce an advanced guard where research and even formal manipulation and invention had to do with producing a new kind of understanding of what architecture is. I think what most of these young offices are really after today is conducting research and uh, formally. I think, I think Greg's work can really be understood as formal research or research in, in datascapes in the way that MVRDV are doing or in larger sort of social, political, economic terms in the way that Sara Polo is um, pushing the boundaries of the practice of architecture itself to really not be asking questions uh, of itself about what it is, but really what it can do. How can architecture intervene as a practice in a larger sort of more expanded understanding of urbanism? I, to me, for me, that's what's exciting about a lot of these young offices, is that they understand, is that the, the, the conditions of possibility are the recognition of the limitations. Architecture is limited in the larger sort of metropolitan sphere. It can only make certain kinds of limited interventions. Recognizing that, I think, allows it a kind of freedom at another level. And I think that's something that all these offices are really cognizant of. And whether they do their research in formal areas and it results in the kind of stuff that you see coming out of Columbia, or whether they do it in the way that the Dutch do, I think they're beginning to move together in a, in a much more interesting kind of emergent set of practices where architecture is one among a whole range of kind of urbanisms and transit. Um, so these poles were set up really as straw uh, people, straw groups. Uh, and I, I do think a lot, of, a, a lot of the most interesting stuff today is shaking out kind of in the middle in between those. Any, uh, any other questions? OK, that's it. Thank you.